Great, thanks, and uh, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity, and uh, hello to everybody. Great to have uh, the opportunity to share some of my research with you. Um, what I'm going to do is to step through a few slides, um, some quickly, some a little more slowly, but uh, maybe we'll get into some specific detail. But I also have access to all of my models sort of online. That's one of the reasons why I'm doing it remotely. So if you want to drill into a particular area um, or a specific topic, um, I can probably pull up some sort of live data as well. But just um, to sort of get going, um, so I'm Martin North, the principal of Digital Finance Analytics, and uh, I do a lot of research on the uh, household sector finances uh, run mod models and also surveys that drive them. And I'll explain about that in a second. Um, my slide is um, <laughs> trying to get you the sense that we're hanging by a thread. Now, that may be a bit surprising, and I'll explain why I believe that actually the household sector is hanging by a thread. Um, so we're not seeing too much pain at the moment, but unfortunately we could uh, later. And so in a way, what I want to do today is to give you a little bit of background as to why I think we are at a very early stage in the evolution of the pressure on households and how that's going to play out in the uh, weeks and uh, months ahead. So without further ado, let me uh, move on to the first slide here. And um, what I want to start with is just uh, a quick recap. So CBA came out and said nothing to see here in their most recent uh, uh, results. You know, provisions and credit quality are fine. And they also said that uh, the troubled impaired assets, nothing really to see here. Um, home loan arrears remained low, supported by a strong labour market, they said. And what are the one of the interesting observations that I'm seeing is that a lot of people are saying there's no sign of problems at the moment. There's no sign of stress, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So what's the story? Is there really anything to see here or not? Now, I want to argue that the reason we're not seeing stress at the moment is it's too early. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The first reason is that if you think about it, it takes two to three months for interest rate rises to flow through to higher mortgage repayments. So we have yet to see the impact on any of the bank results of what's happened in the last couple of months with the higher interest rates that have come through. But secondly, households will do almost anything they can possibly do to continue paying their mortgage or their rent because they need to live and they need to have somewhere to live. So, so what they tend to do is to trim back on other things. And the third point is not all households are in the same boat. So we have a lot of households who are very well protected because they have many buffers and they've got um, significant savings and their incomes are growing uh, reasonably fast even now. So they don't have a problem. So they are doing fine, but there are others that are not doing fine. And unfortunately, what I've been tracking in recent times is the greater proportion of those that are beginning to show the first signs of trouble, which we'll talk by way of stress in a, in a second. Before I do that, I just want to show you this slide. This is the ASX 30-day interbank implied yield curve. It's actually yesterday. I didn't look at it this morning. And you can see that what this is suggesting is that the cash rate, which is currently down here, you know, just over 2.8. Um, in April 2024, the market is thinking it's going to be about 3.8. So what this is suggesting is that we're going to see considerable rises above where we are, 3.9 being the high point in October 2023. Now, one interesting observation, that has come back quite a lot. If you go back uh, a couple of weeks, it was above 4%. But the implied rate is that the cash rate's going to go higher. Now, of course, one of the big questions is, well, how high is the RBA sitting on its hands? Will it wait to see what's going on? And it may well be that they will, because they seem to be getting a bit cold feet about what's going on at the moment. Um, but nevertheless, of course, the wages data yesterday, which was stronger than expected, and the inflation data, which is stronger than expected, suggests to me at least there is a significant probability that the RBA will continue to lift rates. And in fact, in their latest statement, they have said that they are probably going to do it. But timing, of course, is uncertain and quantum is uncertain. And it's also contextualised, I think, by what other central banks are doing around the world. You know, the Fed is looking as though they could have to go to 5% according to the research overnight that came out. The Bank of England had a very high inflation number to deal with. Um, the Bank of England is also going to be impacted by what the uh, Chancellor says in the UK today. 
with regard to constraint on the budget and those sorts of things. So there's a bunch of international contexts which will potentially impact the local rate. So my sort of suggestion is you can't bank no higher interest rate moves. And we've got the situation where interest rates are already flowing through to higher mortgages for those 30% or thereabouts of households with a mortgage. Of course, two thirds don't have a mortgage because they're in rental accommodation or they own the property outright. But that mix is not uniform across the country, as I'll show you in a, in a second or two. Now, the next slide I want to show you is this one. You'll be aware of it, of course. There is a mortgage cliff that is looming because as well as the immediate increase of variable mortgage rates for many households, we know that over the next year or so, a lot of fixed rates are going to be reset. And those fixed rates are going to be resetting from about 2% potentially to maybe 6% or above. Now, that's a really big deal. That's a cliff. And to my mind, this is equivalent to the adjustable rate loan problem that they had in the US through the global financial crisis. And so, of course, the banks are very keen to try and handle this. So there are two things that are going on at the moment. Firstly, a number of organisations are actively considering offering 40-year loans to people coming off the fixed rates um, to spread the, the payments over longer so that effectively the impact is, is lower. And the second is a strategy where they're starting to actively consider saying, well, you, but you can use your superannuation to pay off the capital, so just go interest only and then pay down the loan with superannuation. Now, those are in extremist measures in my view, but they're definitely mainstream conversations around the board tables in a number of the major banks at the moment. So they know that this is a problem. And the Reserve Bank, of course, also knows that this is a problem too. And, you know, roughly, you know, maybe a quarter of people with mortgages are going to have this problem in the next year or so. So this is a big sleeping factor. Another reason why I think we're hanging by a thread. Not a problem yet, but it has the potential to be a problem later. So we've got variable rate loans, which are moving up now. We've got fixed rate loans, which are going to move up. And then we've got the other question, of course, well, what's going to happen to unemployment? Now, unemployment is very low at the moment, and that's one of the reasons why we're not seeing too much pressure. The question, of course, becomes, will unemployment stay low or will unemployment begin to lift up? Now, there is, of course, a migratory change happening at the moment. We're seeing starting to see a, a flow of people back into the country. One of the reasons why the employment rate got so low is because we got rid of about half a million temporary workers through COVID. They went offshore. So there was a lower pool of available people and that's why the unemployment rate went so low. So the question is, will that reverse with migration now being turned up? And whilst that may create some demand for property, will it also lift the unemployment rate high? And of course, if unemployment rates are rising, then that's going to have a significant impact on people's ability to pay their mortgage. So that's one of the things I watch quite closely. Now, just quickly, I'm not going to go through this in detail because I believe you, you've um, had some exposure to the CoreLogic data, but just to say that prices are on the slide and CoreLogic recently published their data that showed that in the uh, three months uh, rolling for Adelaide, Perth, Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane, they're all down. And of course, we had a run up through COVID when ultra low interest rates drove huge lending capacity. And both combined capitals and combined regionals are sliding. And if you look at it on a sort of a, a 12 month, three months and past month, you can see that there's quite a lot of volatility in terms of the movements. But nevertheless, in some areas, prices are sliding quite quickly. And in fact, Brisbane is now moving down even faster than Sydney and Melbourne. And almost all centres, perhaps other than Adelaide, although my latest, latest data in Adelaide is now showing that we're seeing price falls there as well. And, and um, on my YouTube channel, I've done a series of what I call anti-spruik videos, which is where I go through some of the recent price reductions in the property price portals. There's a lot of those amount at the moment. I'm having to do a lot of shows because there is a lot of property on the market, more than ever, but nevertheless, property prices are falling. So I think that's a significant factor to try and read what's going on across the market. And um, if I also want to show you this as well, 
the new listings may be a little lower, but the combined listings is, is actually quite strong. And in, certainly in Melbourne, and to an extent in Sydney, listings are continuing to rise. Now, there are two reasons or three reasons. One is we're seeing a lot of property investors deciding that with no capital growth and with limited returns available, they're putting properties that were for investment on the market. In fact, the stock of property investment is down by about 20% compared to a peak that's the total pool of property available for rent. And that means that we have a market failure at the moment in terms of the investment sector. That's partly driven by the ranges of interest rates and partly other things too, but lower returns. And I'll show you some of the returns a bit later. The second point to make is we have a lot of people now who are sitting on significant equity because of the run-up over the last couple of years. So they're sitting on big equity. And they're now thinking, well, maybe it's a good time to bail out release that equity and take it out of the property sector because property prices are likely to fall. The third factor we're seeing is that the appetite of first-time buyers is significantly down. There was a peak previously, and that's because of borrowing power. Borrowing power is now down somewhere between 20 and 30%. In other words, the amount that you can borrow for the same parameters of income and costs has dropped dramatically in recent times. And what that means is that people are now finding it quite a lot harder to be able to actually borrow to buy. And we're also finding that there's a little bit of an intrusion into that same target sector of the market of some overseas investors who've started to come back, particularly some Chinese investors who are here in Australia, and they're buying as sort of syndicates to buy property as well. So we're seeing that first-time buyers are now competing sometimes with some of those syndicate buyers, and that's another factor that's in the market. So the markets are all over the place when it comes to this. But there's a lot of listings and more to come. I was talking to an agent yesterday. He's expecting another splurge of listings to happen after Christmas. Which takes me, I think, now to my next um, observation. Consumer confidence. This is from Roy Morgan. Consumer confidence is very, very low. It jumped slightly last week but it's way down where it was. Now, if you ask why that is the case, and I see it in my surveys, consumers are feeling the pinch. They're feeling the pinch, not only from the property sector and the mortgage sector, but because of the rate of inflation. And as you know, inflation is somewhere between 7 and 8%, depending on how you look at it. And the RBA uh, is now thinking that the inflation rate will peak perhaps at 8%. The um, budget forecast was 7.75, now it's 8 Probably go higher than that. But the point is inflation is getting deadly because it's getting embedded. And that means a lot of households are now struggling with trying to balance all of the basic parameters of their spending. And unfortunately, many households who are less well off are seeing inflation rates not at 6 or 7%, but at 9 or 10% even now. And that's one of the reasons why the confidence ratings are so low. And by the way, I see that in my surveys too. I measure confidence levels and confidence levels are indeed um, lower than I've seen. And in fact, other than the blip through the COVID, which was, you know, down and then up, this is structurally different. This is confidence. And if you actually then ask about, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to buy large items? Are you going to, you know, think about property transacting? The answer is probably not at the moment. So that's an important factor. The other one that's worth just reflecting on is this. This is from Roy Morgan again. It shows that whilst the ABS unemployment is 3.5, the our Roy Morgan measure is 9.2. And whilst the combined unemployment and underemployment from the ABS is 9.5, the Roy Morgan is 19.7%. And this is quite important because we've started to see a rise in recent times. So I have a feeling that the way that the ABS calculates unemployment is actually artificially telling the story about how low unemployment is. There are a lot of people who are out of the market and there are a lot of people working the odd hour that are not counted. The Roy Morgan stats I've always believed to be a better correlation of reality. So I tend to look at that when I think about what I'm modelling. OK, now let me just briefly touch on my modelling and how I do it and where that takes us. And I'll start sharing some data. So in the modelling, in the world of DFA, what I'm doing is I'm consumer surveying consumer groups 
uh, and also SMEs. I take data from many other sources. I've got this core market model, which is 20 years in the making and basically allows us to slice and dice data. And it runs pretty much everything we do from our YouTube channel through to our blog, through to all the other work that we do. And that then allows us to slice and dice data so we can look at household segmentation. We can look at it from a geographic perspective. We can look at it from a segmentation perspective. And this multidimensionality is critical for what I end up doing because then I can start looking at scenarios. How are things going to play out ahead and begin to make some estimates as to how this could actually impact individual households in individual locations. And so I can take the mortgage stress data, the trajectory of data relating to prices, the buying and selling intentions from the surveys, the migration data, the other economic data, bang it through the core market model, run it through the scenarios. And then that gives us a view as to where property prices may run at an individual suburb and postcode level. So it's a pretty granular process that we do. And by the way, I should just mention when I talk about mortgage stress, this is a very different measure from the one that is traditionally used in the industry, which is 30% of income going on the mortgage. That tells you nothing, because what you need to understand is the total cash flow of the household. So we design stress in cash flow terms. If households have more outgoings, it's sitting one-off discretionary items and income, we define them as stressed. If they have a mortgage, they're in mortgage stress. If renting, they're in rental stress. And investors with cash flow pressures are identified as stressed investors. And we also aggregate the data to establish and estimate the total financial stress on individual households. And we can look at that both as a percentage of households and also the count in a postcode. We think the latter is a better measure because you could have a postcode with a very small household count with a high percentage. And that would show as a, you know, a, a bad number. But in real terms, it may not be as bad as you might want to take it to account to be. The other point to make is that um, once you actually start looking at this, you can then model it, which is what we do. So here is my up to date, well, end of October model. And the first thing I'm going to show you is rental stress, because this is such a huge rise. This is tracking rental stress all the way back from 2000. In cash flow terms, how many renters are underwater? In other words, they're spending more Overall in the household budget, including paying the rent, we're now at 61.44% of households. Big rise in recent times. And that's driven by the rise in the rents. In some cases, new rents are up 20% from where they were, as well as, of course, the other factor, which households are spending a lot more because of inflation. And many people who are renting are less well off and they tend to spend a greater proportion of their income on things like food and other expensive from an inflation perspective, areas. Then we can look at mortgage stress. And the mortgage stress is the yellow line, and you can see there that it's been tracking. In February 2020, before COVID, we had 32.9% of households in mortgage stress. Now we're at 45.2% in mortgage stress. So that's a big rise. It's been up and down a bit. And one of the reasons why it's moving where it is is because people are refinancing. And as they're refinancing, what they're actually doing is taking equity out of their property to pay down other debts and to give themselves some wriggle room. So that's one of the chief reasons why mortgage stress is not going um, up as perhaps as fast as some would expect. But this is still very significant relative to where it was. And of course, the question is, what's going to happen ahead? I will just add one other element to this chart. The household debt ratio, which is what the RBA reports, is 187.5. And this is as at July. Now, that shows you that we've still got a debt to income ratio problem. Remember that only one third of households are borrowing, and this includes SMEs. So if you want to get a real read, you need to multiply it roughly by three. In other words, six times. So the average ratio in Australia relative to mortgage and income is about six times. That's significantly higher from where it was back in the earlier times. And that's, of course, because people have borrowed more, more leveraged, higher underwrite, lower underwriting standards, um, higher exposure. And people, therefore, are more leveraged. And that means that one of the key things to understand is that even if interest rates don't go up that much, because the mortgage relative to income is so much bigger, people are much more exposed to changes and future changes in the mortgage rates ahead. And that's something which we, we will see in a second as we look at the next level of data. 
Now, what I want to do next is to take you through to just some detailed numbers. Now, you'll have those numbers in your pack. I'm not going to go through all of it, but I wanted to share with you some of the key findings. So this is first by state. And what we do is here we list the estimated households. This is based on my model, grossed up for the whole of Australia. I've got mortgage stress, rental stress, investor stress. So those are people who are struggling with their property investing investments. They're not making a return sufficient to cover the costs or they're trying to um, sell the investment property. And financial stress is an aggregate measure. So to help you read it, if you look at mortgage stress, 45.19% of households are in mortgage stress. So there's 9.7 million households of those 1.7 are in mortgage stress. 1.7 million are in mortgage stress. And if you then look at it by just different states, you can see here that the highest are actually in Tasmania, 56%. And I should explain that the yellow is a highlight compared with last month. So this is an increase from last month. The blue is a fall from last month on this particular slide. You can see that 56% in Tasmania, 46% in South Australia, 47% in Western Australia, 48% in Victoria, New South Wales is 44%, and the ACT is 36%. And you can translate that, if you want to, to the numbers of households involved. So just in terms of numbers, New South Wales, 489,500 households in stress, Victoria, 493,700 households in stress. Again, remember, this is cash flow. This isn't uh, necessarily a fall, um, you know, 30% above or below. Um, it is looking at total cash flow. Rental stress is also high, 61.44%. And you can see, again, how it's distributed across the states with significantly high numbers in the ACT, 65%, as well as Victoria, and other states too. And then stressed investors, 21% or just over 613,000 property investors who are struggling with their property investment at the moment. And overall aggregate financial stress, which is one level higher, that's the weighted average of these three, means we've got 43% of households or financial stress, 4.2 million households out of 9.7 who have a cash flow problem. Now, that's an important takeout in terms of understanding what's going on. And quickly, I'll just show you the same story by segment, because I mentioned I use segment analysis too. This is based off the survey. So we have different types of segments. The most significantly exposed is young growing families with 84.95% of those in mortgage stress, which means that we've got about 282,000 households very close to the wind there. We've also got people on the urban fringe and what I call the battling urban. So these are perhaps those in lower socioeconomic groups and they are very highly exposed to. You can see that they are really by far the most um, significantly caught. If you go to rental stress, you can see that first generation Australians, the multicultural establishment group at 67%, are right up there, plus the wealthy seniors. Now, the reason that wealthy seniors are having issues is because their income until very recently was getting compressed because interest rates were low and the returns from their investments was also not actually functioning the way that um, they expected they would. So, and we've Martin, also got... We've just, we've, just got a question, we've just got a question from the room. You know, yeah, please, go, go, go. Yep. So in your grand total tab, uh, table before, mm. got 45.19% of your respondents in average mortgage stress. Yep. So does that mean that 45% of respondents actually have a cash flow outgoings exceeding their income? Correct. Excluding your discretionary one-off items. So that's Correct. a very high percentage of yes. respondents. Correct. That's exactly right. So what they're saying is they are basically borrowing from um, credit cards, borrowing from savings if they've got savings, but on a cash flow basis, they're actually underwater. That's what I'm saying, right? And that includes whether they've got a mortgage or, you know, it, on rental stress. But yes, that's the issue. So I would have guessed um, in, in 2019, this number was in the 30% range. That, that seems very high as well. And you know, you would see some delinquencies or, or, you know, some metric 
that the bank reports showing signs of stress, but we didn't see that. Um, yeah, but but the point the, the point is people can manage this for a period of time, right? So through 2019, 2021, the governments were handing out vast amounts of money through the various stimulus schemes. Interest rates were dropping, so that meant that people got got more out of jail, and they were actually still taking some credit. So if you look at the penetration of credit, overall penetration of credit was down, but there's quite a strong correlation between some of these more stress groups and the higher um, use of credit as well, because there are things that you can do to be able to juggle this. So I'm not saying that these are necessarily people who are going to fall over tomorrow or even next year, right? This is not the measure of delinquency, right? But this is looking below the waterline, if you like, what households are actually dealing with. And like I said, there's, you know, 40, 45% in mortgage stress. That means that 55% with a mortgage are doing absolutely fine. Right? So that's the, that's the thing to sort of get your head around, right? There are a lot of people who are doing absolutely fine, but there are also a lot of people who are not. And that's why it's important to sort of, you know, think about it not just, I think, in terms of the mortgage itself, because people will do their damnedest to continue to pay the mortgage, not least because, of course, it's a non, it, it, it's full recourse. There's no non-recourse in Australia. It's full recourse. So they know that. And the other point is that the... Go on. The other point is the banks, the banks are doing quite a lot to try and help these people. So if they're in hardship, then, you know, they'll, they'll mess around with that. But households are also refinancing. Do you remember I, one of the things I said was a lot of people have been refinancing and when they are doing a considerable portion are pulling equity out to be able to actually deal with some of their immediate cash flow issues. So that's another factor that's in the mix here. The equity mate is alive and well. Is it fair to say, I mean, it all comes back to employment, right? Unless you lose your job, you'll find a way working with the banks, refinance, interest only, cut some expenditure. That That's really the catalyst to see, to see the stress, right? Yeah, so there, there are two levers. One is employment, the second is wages growth, right? Now, we're not seeing any real wages growth. We probably won't for a couple of years, but some people are getting, you know, some income to help. But yeah, you're right. It is the unemployment question. That's why I've honed in on that unemployment number from Roy Morgan, because if in fact, the, you know, if in fact the true number is higher and, you know, if we start to see unemployment start to rise, that for me is, will be the, the, the critical tipping point. So I'm not saying these guys are going to default. I'm not going to, I'm not saying these are going to go delinquent tomorrow. What I'm saying is that below the waterline, there's a lot more going on than perhaps many people would, would assume to be. Martin, uh, uh, just, uh, I, I guess, question. So if 45% today is cash flow negative, they are subs they're funding their cash flow with debt. So either that could be or, or savings. Credit. They might they might have savings. They can, you know, pull okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, so savings or debt. Um and taking equity out of the house of, of housing. Yep. Now if, if housing rolls over it has rolled over, if it continues to roll over, doesn't that lifeline go away for people um in terms of being able to take out equity? And then if you're using credit cards to finance your lifestyle, shouldn't we see delinquencies move up in credit card data, at least for the banks? Before we'd, we'd obviously see credit cards before mortgages, but we haven't really seen any of that either. No. Um, and then the last point I would say, working with the banks, like if, it, if a bank knows you have negative cash flows, are they really willing to give you more debt to fund those cash flows? Okay, well, let's take the third one first. Many yeah. households have multiple financial relationships in Australia. So a single bank doesn't always know the full story about how the household is behaving. And, um, you know, there's some work done on liar loans and how many people tell half truth to the bank. Well, I can tell you in my surveys, I see the same thing. There are a number of people who are not necessarily sharing the full story of their financial profile with the particular lender that they're talking with. So that's the first point. So, Maybe we're blindsided. Maybe some of the banks are blindsided to that. No, I know. I know that there's credit reports and all of those things, but nevertheless, they're not necessarily seeing the whole financial profile of a household. The second one, yes, there is definitely going to be a point when this lifeline, which is currently active at the moment with regard to reaching for more credit, 
one way or the other, could well come to an end. But what I would say is the most recent le leverage point has been buy now, pay later for some of these households. So one of the things I've got is data on buy now, pay later. And what I'm seeing is quite a lot of these people are using multiple buy now, pay later arrangements to sort of try and manage their cash flows. Now, of course, that's not a credit product. It's not controlled as a credit product. It's not reported as a credit product. And so that's another factor in the mix here, which I'm seeing in my data, which isn't necessarily reported. The third is, I agree with you that the delinquency rates overall for credit cards is quite low, but you need to reflect on the fact that that's aggregated data. And we've got a whole bunch of other households who've actually been sitting on big buffers and have been paying down their credit card debt. So it doesn't surprise me that we're not yet seeing a huge amount of pressure translating into higher levels of delinquency, although there are a few pockets now. And in fact, there was, I think, um, one of the, I'm trying to remember which one it was. Well, anyway, one of the, might, made, it might have been Fitch, it might have been S&P, but one of the securitized pool delinquency reports, they reported it last time around and it was going up. And that was the first time it have been going up for some time. So my argument is I think we're at an inflection point. I think we'll see some of these things working through, but not immediately. This is going to take some time. And there are many households that are still going to be able to muddle through. But if income gets crushed because employment degrades, suddenly that could bring a lot of this forward. And that goes right back to, well, where are interest rates going to go? Well, they will gone going up and all those things. So it's a complex well, picture. A question coming through, obviously, there's a lot of people spending beyond their means across all income levels. Do you have an overlay as to how many of those are going to be stressed in a force to sell their property situation, i.e. negative equity, um, you know, real forced disclosure type situation? Yeah, well, I do. I do in my modelling, I do actually make some estimates of where I think, um, you know, defaults are going to be. And they're still going to be quite low for the next, next period. Uh, we're not going to see a massive acceleration in, in the short term. I think it does, though, come down to where those rates are going to be in you know, a year or two's time. Because if inflation continues to rage, as I think it's likely to, and if the RBA has to raise rates higher than they'd want to, that's going to have significant consequences. I'm looking over the next two or three years, and my first question is, what's going to happen to house prices? And I'll show you that. The second question is, and what's going to happen to delinquency? I think delinquency will go up a bit. But I'm not necessarily expecting delinquency to go massively high, nothing like the US at the moment, unless the unemployment rate really starts to go a lot higher. And if that does, then, you know, all bets are off. So we're in this sort of precarious twilight zone, I think, at the moment, rather than actually seeing a huge expected rise in delinquencies in the short term. I think it's more about the impact on the broader property market, and you mentioned negative equity, of course, people can handle negative equity, providing they've got a job and they can go on paying their mortgage. The question becomes, what happens if they then can't, and they're in negative equity? And we're seeing some patches in Western Australia, where people are still in negative equity from the previous run up, where I think delinquencies are beginning to move up a little more smarter at the moment. And um, that's one of the reasons why I'm monitoring WA despite the fact that or all the real estate agents in WA say, oh, it's a massively positive market. I'm not seeing that in my data, and I'm seeing quite a few people beginning to deal with um, some of those issues now, and there are a few postcodes there that I'm quite concerned about. I'll go into a few postcodes in a second or two. All right, thanks. Continue, please. Okay. And thanks for the questions. I um, always like to know that... Uh, you're sort of on my wavelength, as it were. Um, and just on back to the segmentation. So I was just showing you the uh, segmentation. So the multicultural establishment, these are the first generation Australians. A lot of those are actually in rental stress, as are some of the more mature, stable groups and some of the young affluents, because quite a few of those are actually paying big rents. But if I look at investing stress, you can see that the young affluents again, these are people who've got maybe an investment property. Um, 41% are actually struggling with cash flow on that. 35% of exclusive professionals. These are the most exclusive, um, most affluent households with maybe multiple investment properties. Some of those investment properties aren't performing either. And so that you can see there that we've got a bit of an issue there. And so overall, we have 43%. And you can see how it's distributed. A lot of it's amongst the young affluents. A lot of it's amongst the young growing families. 
and a lot of it's amongst the battling urban so they're the ones on the on on the fringe and i'll show you some charts in a second to sort of bring that to life um now just to take the conversation so here is just to give you an example this is actually by mortgage stress and it's the proportion so it's the count not the proportion um and this is of all households this is, whether they're borrowing or not this is how many are in mortgage stress so in this particular postcode 2170s this is the postcode in Australia at the moment with the biggest problem in terms of mortgage stress on my definition. So it's around Liverpool. And we've got 80% of households with a cash flow problem. That's more than 11,000 households. And then you go across to Tapping and uh, Wanneroo, places like that in Western Australia, 6065, with 11,000. Up to Toowoomba, a regional area, a large regional area with more than 10,000. Then we go to Victoria, to Roxburgh Park, with more than 9,000. Hoppers Crossing, another one in Victoria. Fountain Gate, Narrow Warren in Victoria. Another one there as well in Victoria. And then we come back to uh, Riverston, 2765, including Oakville, Nelson. And then we go across to Cranbourne. And one you'll see as you start looking at these, a lot of these are high growth corridors. A lot of people have bought relatively recently, a lot of first time buyers. Plus, of course, some regional centres. So Ballarat, for example, is on the list. So they're the top ones. And I actually have <laughs> all postcodes pretty much stack ranked. I also do the same for rental stress. I won't go into detail other than the high, that Toowoomba and Liverpool are there on the list right at the top, as well as more affluent areas around Southport um, on, the, on the Gold Coast. And I have similar data for property stressed investors. And interestingly, those who've got properties for investment in Melbourne is actually the worst exposed with 4,700 in rental stress there, uh, as well as uh, other areas like around Darlinghurst and Surrey Hills in New South Wales. So you can see that there's a bit of a flavour as to where some of those are. A lot of those, of course, are units. A lot of those were actually vacant and slowly getting more people coming back into them, but still are somewhat exposed. And then I have an overall financial stress metric. So the metric where it's worst overall is Campbelltown, then Toowoomba, then Liverpool, then Cranbourne, then the centre of Melbourne, and then uh, Lethbridge Park and Mount Druitt in New South Wales. And you can go down the list. So that gives you a bit of a flavour as to how that works. Another way I can do it is to show you by way of a map. Now, this is just a slide view, but what I can also do is actually go to look at the overall map. Okay, so this is actually showing you, this happens to be the New South Wales one, and the red is showing you the percentage of households and postcodes where there's issues, right? Now, the thing that's interesting about this is that you can actually then start to see where some of the problems are. And Western Sydney is where a lot of it is, around Blacktown, down to Fairfield, down to Campbelltown. And the beauty of this is a dynamic map. So I can actually literally pull in, pull out and look at the spreads. And, you know, if somebody wants to say, well, let's give me um, give me new, uh, Victoria. So let's go to Victoria. I can actually apply that and it will automatically load. There we go. So I'm now looking at Victoria 3000. And as I pull out you can start to see where some of the pressure points are. And just to make it clear, the blue is the lowest proportion. The red is the highest proportion. And you can see that there are particular areas. Mooney Vale, for example, comes out as one where there's an issue. And if you go to the sort of west of Melbourne, you can see that there are a lot of areas around there in some of those high growth corridors. Um, some areas around uh, Werribee as well on the other side there. And as you pull out more, you can sort of get a view. So I can do that for the whole of Australia. And uh, what that does, Ballarat there is, is, is showing up as a, as a significant area. The point I want to make about this is it shows you that this is a very patchy story. This isn't uniform across the country. And so all these aggregate averages, which talks about average levels of delinquency or average levels of stress, don't tell you the full story. You need to actually go really granular to really understand what's actually going on. And that's what I think so important about what I do in my modelling, 
because it, what it tries to do is to get you a sense of what the real true story is in terms of where things are. Now, the next part of the story then is the scenarios, right? So I also think about how things might progress ahead. And so scenarios are a way of exploring different futures, not saying it's right. I'm just saying, what if? And so I use my core market model to do that. I've got three scenarios at the moment. The first scenario is that we've got a best scenario where rates stay, let's say, above 3%. And full next year, inflation eases ahead of the RBA expectations while wages rise faster, no recession in Australia. That's the best scenario. The base scenario is that rates rise to 3.5%, which would mean mortgage rates were 6 or 7%, stays high in 2023. Inflation stays above target until 24, no recession in Australia. And the worst case is that rates rise to about 4% with a mortgage rate of 7%, stay high into 2024, along with inflation, and wage growth stalls due to recession and rates will fall later. So those are the three scenarios. Now, what I can then do is I can then start playing with that. And here is a scenario based on 1 November. And I can then show you how house prices, this is for all Australia, may vary on the best, the base case, and the worst case. So the best case is over the next three years, cumulatively, you might see um, a couple of percent up. The base case is 22% down. The worst case is 40% down. And I do the same for units. And units don't move quite as far, simply because we didn't get as much in the way of upside to units over the last couple of years than for houses. Houses went through the roof because of people migrating to regional areas, thanks to escaping COVID and all those things. So that gives you a bit of a flavour at an aggregate level of what things are like. But that doesn't tell you that much. But what does is then I can apply this way of thinking to individual postcodes. And so this is my core market model in action. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch across to this picture here. Let's make sure that works. Go there, go there. Right. OK, so this is now live mo mo data model. OK, this is live. So if you give me a postcode, I can tell you the answer. But I want to just take you through how this works, because this shows you in painful detail how it works and why it's important. There are, so I've got 2171. This is actually Hoxton Park in Sydney. I was just doing this for somebody the other day. 10,000 households in the postcode according to the census, right? 18% are outright, 61% are borrowing, 20% are renting in the postcode. 84% in this postcode have a cash flow problem. That's more than 5,600 people with mortgages. 46% of renters have a rental problem with cash flow. And overall, the flow is 62.2% are in financial stress. That's an aggregate stress. Then I can run scenarios and say, well, best case scenario, over the next three years, we might see a drop of 3% for houses. The base case would be a fall of 31%. The worst case, if things went really bad, down 49%. Now, those are big drops, but, you know, depends on your scenarios, obviously. And then we can look at things like the mix of property. This is 93% houses. There's around 6% in other types. That includes things like temporary accommodation, caravans, living over commercial premises, those sorts of things. And then we have a people ratio, which is the ratio of properties to people based on the census, 3.57, which is actually quite high. We've got a vacancy rate on census night last year, not very high at 255. And then we have an average gross investment yield, which is the ratio between the price of property and the rent commanded, 3.2%, which is quite low. And the net investment yield is actually after all the costs, mortgages, etc., and other management fees on the investment property. So people are not making any money at all from an investment perspective at the moment in this postcode. I've got data from the ATO, average taxable income, 75,000, average household census data per household, $123,000. And then I've got that translated to a disposable monthly income of around $7,600. And this is the killer. 37% is going on the average mortgage repayment at $2,860. So from the disposable monthly income, 37%. From the average renting income, 34.5% at 2,642. 
Now that gets you to the heart of why this is so critical when you try to figure out what goes on, right? Now, I can, if you somebody wants to suggest an alternative postcode to look at, I've got every, pretty much every postcode in the country in the, in the model. But this really gets to the granularity that's critical, right? In this particular postcode, we have a lot of people who have got cash flow pressure. As a result of that, we're gonna see significant downward pressure on property prices and potentially higher delinquencies ahead. That is an important observation because if you go down the road to more affluent households, you might have a different, um, a different story in a different postcode. But this is where I think my modeling gets really quite powerful in trying to understand what is really going on. Um, what I'll be able to do now is I'm just gonna give you an alternative. Let me go to uh, something, 2090. I'm going to another postcode. I'm going to 2090, which is um, Cremorne in New South Wales, and just quickly walk you through that. So 6,500 households there, 29% own outright, 24% are borrowing, 45% are renting. Here, 28% are in mortgage stress at 1,400, but 48% are renting uh, with rental stress, 1,400. And overall, financial stress is quite significant because quite a few investors have difficulty. As a result of that, there's a risk that prices could fall and fall quite significantly, even in the best case scenario, because of what I'm seeing here. And that's despite the fact that we have significantly higher incomes, 149,000 average taxable according to the ATO and 131 according to the census data. We also know that only 16.5% of houses, most of them are units in this area. And on census night, 11.9% were vacant. 830. That means that there's a significant question there about um, how many are, are free at the moment, spare at the moment. Gross investment yield 3.5%, net investment yield 0 0.3. And the disposable monthly income on average just over 7,700 with 48% on average going on the average mortgage and 38% going on the average rent. So you can see here how this varies. A few questions coming through, so we might. Uh, you've gone through the bulk of the prezzo. Is that fair yep. to say? Or? Absolutely. Yeah. Nick, did you, you had a question? No. Uh, yeah, M Martin, um, I, have you done pr pretty extensive work on translating the home price declines into delinquency, or is that sort of too complex of a function because it's not just about peak to trough home price, it's about the duration that it's at that at that decline or i guess how does that fit into the data that you're able to collect with the yeah I, in my model i do have delinquency data i don't actually report that um publicly at the moment partly because of the fact that it is very it depends ish you know what are the what are the banks going to do what are people going to do one of the observations is there are a lot of people who are actually under significant pressure from the banks to put their property on the market and, and sell and so where banks have recognised that people's income has fundamentally changed, whether it's because of illness or job or whatever, um, there's a lot of pressure now by the banks for them to put their property on the market to sell it before they get into difficulty. And in some cases, the banks will say, you know, we're not going to be able to support you long term, but short term, we'll give you a bit of wriggle room. So that's one of the factors. Now, that's a very different factor from what we saw um, a few years ago where banks were sort of more willing to push people into the, um, in, into the foreclosure route. The foreclosure process itself in Australia can take two to three years to work through. So banks don't really want to get into that, public, pu pu plus, of course, all the public um, um, pressure that comes from, from the pressure of the banks, you know, forcing people out. So there's a very strong move at the moment to encourage people to move. I've modeled some of that, though, and I do have some delinquency numbers in my model, but I, I don't publish them because, you know, I think it's pretty um, um, unpredictable. Delinquencies are still quite low. I think they will remain low for the next few months. But ahead of that, depending on how the scenarios play out, if prices come back up again, probably will be fine. But if prices do continue to drop and if rates are higher than people expect, then some of those delinquency numbers will start hitting and, of course, will potentially hit you know, the bank's bottom line. So that's what I'm seeing. What I'm seeing. Thanks, Martin. Can I ask a few? Yeah. Martin, thanks so much. Um, I just wanted to ask you, just on the, the mortgage stress that you show in, in that chart from October 2022, I mean, it's, it's interesting to note 
that you had quite a significant jump actually in mortgage stress in February 2020. But if you if you think about it, that really coincided too with a very substantial increase in property prices, which is interesting. And then during that period of time, at the same time, you actually had quite a substantial increase in savings, right? Yeah. Within Australia. So how do you reconcile those dynamics? And then the second question and third question I had was just around the cash flow negative number that you provide, that 45.19%. Do you have any sense on, on being able to quantify what the negative cash flow position is? Is it negative $1,000, 2005, 10? Kind of give some context around how big negative cash flows are. And then the third question is, do you have a sense of what the savings pools of these different cohorts actually looks like? What can they tap into from a savings perspective? And also maybe just additionally from a liquidity perspective, right? Access to, you know, you've mentioned credit cards, credit card balances in Australia haven't been going up. So it doesn't look like that's a source of liquidity that consumers have been drawing on. So just some sense around what that savings pool looks like. Yeah. Okay. Let me answer the third and I'll work back. And if I missed anything, you yeah. Ask me again. So with regard to the savings pools, um, in my model, because I survey individual households, I actually have data on the individual financial footprint of that household. So I've got their debt, I've got their income, I've got their savings, um, and I can see their source. So I know whether it's equity, um, you know, investments, whether it's actually um, credit cards, whether it's actually um, deposit accounts, whether they're using buy now, pay later. So I've got all that information. And there's a distribution, of course, as you'd expect. Generally, what I'm seeing is that the households with the cash flow problem are tending to be the ones where they've got very limited savings, very li limited savings capacity. So what they're tending to do is to manage their cash flow deficits by doing three things. One, working more. So they tend to have multiple jobs, including some part-time jobs to try and pull more income in. Secondly, what they're doing is they're spreading their expenses by using things like buy now, pay later, which is sort of shifting money around and hopefully paying it off, although more than 25% of them don't actually manage to pay it off without paying high penalty fees in the process because they miss payments. And the third is that some of them are actually able to deal with the small amount of savings they've got by sort of stealing a bit until they get to the point where they try to refinance and then try and clear it out that way. Not everybody can refinance, of course, and the banks are way more picky. Although, interestingly, I believe that the underwriting standards are much looser than they were six to 12 months ago. When there's a refinancing event going on, a lot of the banks don't seem to bother to check anymore. They tend to sort of pretty much say, well, if the previous bank gave it to you, we're happy to give it to you. Uh, which is interesting. Um, so I'm concerned about the underwriting standards. There's also huge competition, of course, to refinance. And that means that people are able to perhaps, uh, you know, pick and choose a bit more than they, they might. But there are some households who are in mortgage prisoner land. In other words, they've got very little ability to refinance because their finances are pretty much shot. They're already paying quite a lot more than perhaps the best rate in the marketplace. And they're unable to switch. So that's another factor that's in the mix. The second one that I think you asked was was about the hmm, hang on let me ask answer the one about the the mortgage stress yeah so mortgage stress went up one of the things that we saw through the COVID cycle was that rates dropped dramatically when rates dropped property prices went up when property prices went up people were able to borrow bigger and as they were able to borrow bigger. <laughs> they immediately got themselves into the situation where their financial flow was a little bit um, a little bit more dodgy. So I think that's part of the, the factor. And the amount of savings that people have now do vary quite considerably. There are some that are still very, very comfortable. And despite the fact the stock markets have come down from their peaks, et cetera, et cetera, they feel reasonable. Another point I'd make is that some people still held money in term deposits. Now, those term deposits being to move over into start paying a little bit more. And so some of the more affluent, um, you know, wealthy affluent groups are now starting to see a slightly stronger income flow from those term deposits, which are now paying up. You know, you can get 4.95 if you if you know where to look. So that's giving them a little bit more wriggle room than previously, whereas earlier on they had a real issue because their income flows were being 
well, crushed, frankly, when term deposit rates fell through the floor, and they fell through the floor through 2021 and 22. So those are some of the factors in the in the mix there. I'm not sure they answered all of your bits of question. If I didn't, throw it to me again. Yeah, it's it, it's just um, I mean obviously you're kind of painting a relatively negative picture around you know mortgage stress is fairly high, um, but if you go and have a look and just kind of look at the data points historically along this chart, you know some of it's not necessarily consistent with you know mortgage stress doesn't necessarily lead to delinquencies doesn't no, have an impact no. necessarily on. Oh uh, well, but, but just to be clear, yeah. I'm not I, I'm not suggesting that mortgage stress is a forward leading indicator of delinquency. I'm just okay. highlighting the pressures on households that are there and the pressures are building, of course, because inflation is high. And I'm genuinely I don't know how this is in the play out, which is why I talk about different scenarios. You know, it may it may well play out okay. But what I'm saying to you is that some of the um averaged data that's being published, like from the ABS and what have you, don't give you enough granularity to understand where the where the pain points might be. That's what I'm really just trying to get at. I guess like in 2019, you had mortgage stress, but no delinquencies because of stimulus and home prices increasing, increasing so you can refi. Yep. And now you have higher mortgage stress and you have inability to refi at a higher uh, at a higher LTV because your home prices come down and you have no stimulus. And so wouldn't this time it, it, there be a higher correlation between mortgage stress and delinquencies, or is that still unfair? To say? No, I think I think there's more likely to be. Remember that we had the um, the get out of jail card from the bank saying, "Well, you know, we we, we won't, we, you know, th we'll, we'll protect you through COVID, right?" And we also had the government stimulus, and we had ultra low interest rates. So those that 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 saved a lot of, a lot of people. Otherwise, we'd have had very high levels of default and those sorts of things. I I'm of the view that we are now looking at the very leading edge of a considerable problem ahead unless rates, you know, stay and unless unemployment stays low and unless, unless. So there are more questions to my mind that would suggest we could be looking into a higher period of delinquency ahead. I'm not certain yet about how high that delinquency will be and when it will hit. But to me, the conditions are now rising in sort of severity with interest rates rising, with financial pressure rising, with inflation rising, with those big mortgages biting. And we already know that some people are mortgage prisoners. So, yeah, I, I, trying to estimate that is, is more complicated. Like I say, I don't publish public estimates of what I think the link is going to be because there are so many. It depends and it depends on what the banks do. But I do believe we're in a different situation from where we were in the beginning of the COVID cycle. So there are there are no... There were no supports like there were. Martin, a few questions coming through uh, on email. Uh, this one a bit technical. Banks RWA calculations are based on probability of default. Uh, in your view, how does that reflect the risk of changes in demographics? Namely, one income required to pay the mortgage back in the 1990s versus now, there's typically two. Uh, so I guess twice the risk of retrenchment impacting the ability to repay the loan. How do banks get comfortable when calculating their stress testing scenarios? Yeah, absolutely. So two two points there. You're absolutely right. Most people now need at least two incomes <laughs> to be able to pay the mortgage. Um, it's it's quite scary actually looking at, at how that works. You know, the, the debt to income ratio is still in some cases at six, seven, eight times even now, which is crazy. It should be two to three times, I think, in my view. One of the reasons, of course, is that it was some um, you know, deleveraging of the financial system, the uh, ability to be able to actually... Um, uh, underwrite bigger mortgages, chased house prices up, lifted bank balance sheets, gave them more capacity to lend, more, all those things. On the risk weightings, um, I'm not very satisfied with the way that the banks are doing this at the moment. And um, in fact, I've had a couple of conversations recently with a couple of banks who are wanting to get more granular, doing postcode level analysis rather than the higher aggregate risk weighting analysis. Um, unfortunately, I believe that the risk weights that they apply are probably inappropriate for the current conditions that they're actually seeing. And I think they're understating the risks in their portfolios. That's one of the reasons why I believe that they are still able to claim low levels of provisioning. I don't think that their modelling is up to it in the current environment because there are these, these changes that have come through. They're moving quite fast. 
Uh, and certainly my own calculations on where people are and what their risks are in terms of you know potential default and all those things seem to me to be quite a lot higher. But again, it's patchy, right? Because if you look at certain postcodes, there's almost no problem. But if you look at other postcodes, I'm seeing much more difficult issues. And I don't believe necessarily that their risk weights are actually calibrated appropriately. The other point I'd make is that the RBA, when they actually talk about risks in the mortgage system, they're using the securitized pools as their core source of data. But I want to highlight to you that the securitized pools are self-selected or hand-selected examples of mortgages. They're not the standard statistically robust sample that the RPA would like it to be. Because by definition, securitized mortgages are not necessarily coextensive with the total market in terms of distribution. And what that means is that it could well be that the securitized pools are not behaving in the same way as some of the other sectors of the mortgage market. And I think we're going to see that playing out. So I think there's a lot of questions about the risk weights and how it works at the moment. Thank you. Next question. Any visibility of pension and government support given indexation to CPI and rental assistance for poorest consumers? Yep. So I factor that into the model where I can. Um, we, we know the source of income for households, so we're able to say whether it's income, whether it's government pension or or some other thing, and we actually sensitise that in the modelling for where it might go. And, of course, we, we also do that for some of the, the low pay groups. So, you know, the the recent fair wage settlement had a significant impact in some households and some of those actually, particularly those with mortgages, got themselves out of trouble. That's another reason why the, why, why the uh, uh, mortgage stress numbers is where they are. So I do model that. Um, what I also make the point is that a lot of those don't necessarily have mortgages. A lot of them are actually paying rent. And so some of those rental stress numbers are being influenced by the you know, relative movements between those who are actually um, receiving some pensions and supports and the rents going up. I'm very concerned about rental stress because, you know, new rents going up by 20% plus. And it's worth observing, of course, that the rent number actually gets reported in the ABS inflation statistic. Now, they've got an inflation number which is very low at the moment, 1% or 2%, I think it was last time around. The new rents are going up a lot higher, which would suggest to me that we're going to see an inflation kicker from rents ahead. And so I have a feeling that's another reason why inflation will probably stay higher than many people expect. It's a good segue into the next question, which was, it's rare to see rents going up 10% each year and house prices going down 10%. At what point do renters become buyers? Yeah, so there's a real issue at the moment because the average renter may be able to save slightly more if they've got any disposable income, but many don't have any disposable income because you can get a bit more interest now on that um, on that uh, deposit. But they can borrow a lot less because the, the um, borrowing power has been reduced significantly on average 30% now for a lot of, a lot of those, those households. So many people in, are in a rental situation where they're really struggling and trying to figure out what to do. Then, of course, what happens is that you get a rent uplift. And, of course, you know, depending on the arrangement that you've got with regard to your landlord, it might be once every few years or it might be more frequent. Those rent increases are significant. I've had a number of conversations with individuals who basically get confronted with a 20% increase in rent, which they can't afford, and then, then try and work out, well, what do we do? Do we try and find somewhere that we can buy? And then they sort of do the numbers and they, well, that doesn't work necessarily. So there's a, there's a, there's a problem because both the rent and the mortgage side of the house, neither of them working very well at the moment. And I think this, this fundamental disconnect, we've got a policy failure here which is a structural policy failure thanks to 20 to 30 years of bad government policy, poor lending standards, poor housing policy, and all of those things. And it's coming home to roost now. And therefore, we've got a homeless issue and a potential homeless issue like we've never seen before. And of course, we've also opened the gates now to further migration, which is going to put further upward pressure on rents and on rentals. But I make the point, a lot of property investors are still underwater on a cash flow basis. I see that in my modelling. And I also know that there are some suburbs where even now property investments that were bought in 2017, 
North Ryde, for example, high-rise apartments in 2017 were worth more than they are today. So property investors are looking at a potential capital loss if they get out or a cash flow loss if they stay in and they have little ability to try and actually push rents up higher because people can't afford to pay the higher rents. This is a major structural issue for the economy in my view and unfortunately I feel that um, sometimes we get sort of fixated on trying to fix one bit of the housing problem rather than thinking holistically. This is a big structural issue for Australia. Thank you. Next question. Aren't you expecting the banks to compete very hard for the $500 billion of fixed rates up for refinancing next year? Isn't there a scenario where standard variable rates currently around 4.5% could be back below 4 Depends on what you think the cash rate's going to be, I suppose. I mean, the, the, if you look at the margins, the recent margins, they're up a bit. But the banks are still struggling, of course, with international financing. One of the reasons why they're actually uh, amping up deposits Term deposits are cheaper than some of the international financing at the moment, which is interesting. That's a big change from where it was previously. Um, there will be some competition, but I think what we're going to see is there's going to be competition for some types of borrowers with lower loan-to-value ratios, with more certain income, the lower risk third, as it were, and everyone will fight for those. I think we're going to see some households who will have significant pressures trying to be able to refinance. I've already spoken to a number of people in the last couple of months who went to the bank trying to refinance and the bank said, we can't because you're on a higher risk. So we, in fact, we put you on a higher rate rather than the lower rate. So I think there's going to be some of that going on. There will be segments where the banks will compete because of course there's no absolute growth or I think the credit growth is going to be a lot lower than people were expecting ahead. And of course, there was a bit of a peak over the last couple of years, come down again. So that means that picking off the best parts of the current market through the refinancing is absolutely going to be there but i have a feeling that there are going to be some people left out in the cold and i also think that looking at the banks some of the smaller banks will have less ability to compete so i suspect this will create additional market concentration amount among the big banks and macquarie to be able to actually um, support some of this yeah, we've got two last questions. Um, there's a build-up in equity for most homeowners other than, than perhaps those who bought at the peak. Isn't it the case that households can accommodate this impact more than would normally be the case? That is, unbund that is unbundling the, the cash flow impact and the equity gain impact could be a little one-dimensional. I guess you've somewhat covered that in terms of refinancing. Well, but, but yeah, and remember I said 45% are difficult. There's 55% fine. A lot of those have huge buffers and huge ability to be able to actually, you know, sit on vast amounts of equity. But my concern is that the equity concentration is in those that don't have a problem. A lot of those with a problem don't have the same equity buffers. They've got higher loan to value ratios. They bought more recently. They've got less ability to refinance and, and pull out um, equ any equity they may have. And of course, as property prices fall, if you believe that property prices are not going to fall very far, then your thesis holds. But if you think property prices are going to drop 20 or 25 percent, and remember they're massively overvalued relative to any measure, look at on the international basis, we're, you know, behind Switzerland, we've got the worst um, ratios in the world, um, that could be a problem. So it depends a little bit on, I guess, where interest rates are going to go and also um, where property prices are going to go. Those two things are a bit correlated, of course. So, yeah, that's why it's very uncertain. But I'm, I'm of the view that there are some fine, some not. Right. Last question. Any views on why the consumer spending has disconnected so far from consumer confidence? Yeah, so there's a couple of reasons. One is there are still many households who've got plenty of money and uh, plenty of ability to spend. But the other point is consumer spending is inflation-led. If you look in spending in inflation adjusted terms there's almost no growth so what we're actually seeing is people are spending to buy the same things as they've always bought but they're having to pay a lot more because of the inflationary impact so that's the first factor that's in there the second is that the consumer confidence measure is a forward-looking one whereas the spending one is a a, a backward-looking one i think there's going to be a turn i expect spending to continue to ease back i think people are going to have a very crunchy christmas this time, I think in the new year, some of these um, other factors that have come through, I think rates will be a bit higher. I think property prices will have fallen some more. And I expect that the confidence, lack of confidence will stay there, which means that we are going to see less spending ahead. And of course, that's significant for the broader economic factors because GDP is 
significantly supported by cons consumption and consumer spending. So that's one of the reasons why I believe the economic outcome over the next year or so is going to be somewhat lower. Don't think we'll see a recession in the short term unless we get some international downdraft from, say, China. But we're certainly going to see GDP a lot lower. And of course, that was in the last budget. And that's partly because of a downturn in terms of consumer spending. So as I say, I think spending's looking in the rearview mirror. Consumer confidence is looking in the forward mirror. And at the moment, if you take the read from Roy Morgan, you'd expect spending to drop. All right. Thank you, Martin. I think we're out of questions. That was a uh, phenomenal presentation. Lots of uh, useful insights, as always, and clearly uh, will be even more topical if, if rates continue to rise and we have you know, have an unemployment cycle to see just how, how sensitive we are to the downside. But um, I, I should remind people, Martin's always available. Um, if you have his details, if you want to go through and, and, and get more information from him, he's open to having a discussion around how that works. But um, appreciate the time, as always. And um, hopefully we do this in another six months and we'll see where we're placed. Well, thanks very much for the opportunity. And yeah, there's plenty of data on the DFA blog. The link is uh, there on the presentation. Or indeed, I'm, my YouTube shows, I make shows daily on what I'm doing. And uh, always happy to have conversations about what my analysis is. And if there's a particular query or a particular slice of data that you're interested in, I've probably got it. I've got 140 elements in my model. So there's a lot of, lot of insights that uh, I can't share today, but I'm happy to share. So thanks for the opportunity.